June 6th, 1898. Dear Mama, it's an hour after taps and I'm quite sleepy. It's quite cool tonight. I'm half reclining, curled in my blanket in my pup tent. Jim, Sergeant Lerman, is snoozing quietly in his half. The stars are very clear and everything is quiet. We had excellent stew for supper. The boys called it cleanup, as it contains three days scraps. Hard tack and black coffee completed supper. <laughs> that sentence ought to be copyrighted. It's always true. June 7th. Well, this is the strangest birthday I've ever had. Sand, heat, fleas, flies, gnats, hunger, dirt, and an intense desire to walk up to our front steps back home. No, I have not got the blues, as you may think, but I'm just stating facts. I'm actually enjoying myself, but I wish you would lay in a supply of stamps and let me know what is going on at home. My stomach is getting better now, and I think it will be okay. Tell Papa that I'll go with the regiment and won't be left behind. Good night, love to all, Henry. June 12th. Dear Mama, this is Sunday. Hot, hotter, hottest. I'm lying under a live oak from whose massive branches hang in the famous hanging moss. A slight breeze is our only salvation here. I go swimming morning and evening in Tampa Bay. The water is fine and refreshing, but does not clean yet. I swam three miles this a.m. Lots of chance to rest in the shallow water if you get tired. The rainy season started in yesterday evening. Came down in bathtubs full. Our pup tents make excellent shower baths. Sprayed the water all over you. Love to all. Your son, Henry. June 18th, Dear Mama, Regardless of what the papers say, the food is miserable. For six days, I've been living on one meal per day and having to buy that one. Once in a while, we get something good. Very seldom. Coffee rank. I've not touched any for 10 days except to taste it. Undershirts are not much good here. Too hot. Heat here is heat. Between 10 and 5, you can hardly move. Tampa is, collectively speaking, a bum place. June 23rd. Dear Mama, my stomach seems well. Night before last, I was carried to the hospital with the strangest illness I have had. A sick headache and a weakness that was awful. But they got my stomach cleaned out. I vomited scraps of bacon that I know I ate at Camp Alger. Now I feel better, internally, than at any time since leaving home. I've got some cuts on my feet, of course, but they don't count nothing to speak of. This is a terrible place for whiskers. Today I shaved off a week's growth. Before I shaved it, I looked 30 years old. Most all the boys have half beards. June 29th. Dear Mama, I'm feeling okay. If they would keep us on the move, I'd feel okay all the time. This waiting knocks us, just waiting for boats. If Papa thinks I want to discharge, he has forgotten what Dobsons are made of. I'll come home with the boys. Don't worry about me. I'm getting stronger now that my stomach is settled. Good sign when I don't write. Too busy. We'll write when I can. Your affectionate son, Henry. July 2nd. Dear Papa, it is 2 a.m. I haven't slept any yet. Reveille is to sound at 3 a.m., so I won't go to sleep at all tonight. We break camp at 4.15 a.m. and go to Port Tampa to embark. I'm feeling okay. Well... I have to stop now. Goodbye, Henry. 
July 6, 1898. Our trip to Tampa, outside of the heat, was uneventful. We arrived at Port Tampa at 8.30 p.m. July 5th. We were met by Miss Laura Gill, chaperone of another party of 15 Red Cross nurses that had left New York the day before us. Miss Gill, with her party, had spent the night at the Port Tampa Inn. As the inn was full of officers, the nurses had slept on the billiard table. Some were lucky enough to get cots. Some slept in the inn barbershop. For their bathing, they had draped a sheet across a corner in the billiard room with a pail of water each in turn waited for a wash. With our party coming, Miss Gill decided to take us all to the Tampa Bay Hotel for the night at least, so we could have a night's rest and clean up after the hot journey. After breakfast, we were called to one of the hotel drawing rooms. Miss Gill laid conditions before us. We, as woman buyer deportment, might gain confidence in order to get transportation and report to Miss Clara Barton in Cuba. As a camp with 20,000 men was opposite the hotel, she said we would be chaperoned both going about and also in the dining room. Nobody would be allowed out after dark. This evening, the military band played for the officers. General Shafter has his headquarters here. We were allowed to listen but as wallflowers. While this was going on, the first call for nurses came. Dr. Delancey from the Army Hospital Corps stationed on Picnic Island called for help. Miss Carson and Miss Coffin were detailed for the night. July 7th. This morning, Miss Dilworth and I went on duty on Picnic Island. From the name, one would have the impression it was a pleasant place, but it's a poor place for a picnic, and even worse for a hospital. The island is a short distance from the mainland. The army wagons with the supplies drive through the water. The plant system runs the trains over a trestle, and a plank walk over the trestle leads to the Port Tampa Inn. The island is small. You can easily look across it if the view were not obstructed by palms and brush. We found the men in a small tent, three of them on narrow canvas cots, no mattresses, no bedding, except for their blanket. The night nurses had been able to do little, as they found no supplies of any kind. They took the train back. We came on and so reported these conditions. A few miles away was the palatial Tampa Bay Hotel, where not only the necessities, but most of the luxuries of life could be had for the asking. By noon, supplies purchased with Red Cross funds arrived so we could make them comfortable. I think they appreciated the netting the most. That night, I slept alone at the inn, which was built on trestles, and every little while, something disturbed me, which proved to be porpoises jumping in the bay under my window. July 9, went to Picnic Island and found five patients this morning. Two were suspected typhoids, including Beeman of Company A Battalion Engineers. He said that he must go on the Lampasas, our transport to Cuba, whether he was sick or well, as his younger brother was going, and he promised his mother that he would not leave Harry unless he was killed. Tonight, a hospital train left for Georgia with wounded Rough Riders that had arrived today from Cuba. One of our patients' bowmen was very ill, and he also was transferred. July 10. Still on duty. Beeman is much better and will sail with his company. Tonight, another party of nurses arrived. They all slept on the Pullman train car. No room at the inn. July 11. A torrential rain. Met the night nurses and they were wet through and through. They reported the cots standing in water as the tents had not been floored. We were told we need not go on duty, but were anxious for our patients. So, tucking up our dresses and donning raincoats, we started. There was a gale blowing, too, and before we reached the trestle, we were wet through, as we could not hold an umbrella. The patients were glad to see us. And with the help of a hospital corpsman, a trench was dug around the tent so the water could recede. 
By 12 noon, we were called back as our ship, the Lampasas, was readying to sail. Beeman was discharged in time to go. We did not see our relief, but our hearts ached for the new nurses to start on such a day. We were also sorry to leave our patients. July 25th, yellow fever had broken out in Cuba. When we arrived in Santiago Harbor, we received orders that only immunes could land, as the place was under quarantine. The Lampasas was sent to Ponce, Puerto Rico, where Colonel Greenleaf appeared and said he had decided to turn the transport into a hospital ship. We had orders to change clothes and be ready to receive patients. We were hardly in uniforms before the first ones arrived. Within two days, we had 140 patients, including 80 men from the USS Yale. July 27th. General Miles and Colonel John Gilmore came on board today. As I had trained under Colonel Gilmore's sister in Bridgeport, Connecticut, he called for me. In speaking to me, he said, every one of you girls should be home. General Miles heard him and turned to him and said, John, every nurse here is worth 15 men to me just now. It gave us courage to know at last we were appreciated. Cuba, July 28th, 1898. Dear Mama, fever rages here, but not yellow jack. The fever lasts from four days to two weeks, but it is not dangerous. Thirteen men had it yesterday, twenty today in our company. K has thirty-five. Some of my men are getting well, others are coming down with it. I guess we will all eventually tumble to it. July 29th. It was decided to send the transport to the USA. The time we waited in Ponce was too awful to describe. Delirium and death were all around us. A few showed signs of improvement. We learned that from the time the USS Yale had left Charleston to go to Puerto Rico, the men had never set foot on shore, and their illness was the result of overcrowding, insufficient and improper food, neglect of ordinary precautions, and filth. August 1st. I'm holding my own now. Stomach okay. I got the fever day before yesterday. Ate quinine and knocked it. Little weak yet, but I didn't give in. <laughs> Expect that we will move soon. Give love and regards to everybody. Your loving son, Henry. August 6th. We had few supplies of food and clothing, and altogether we lost eight men. Four were buried in Puerto Rico, and four were buried at sea. There is something awful about a burial at sea. Everybody realized those solemn moments, for although the dead were strangers to us, each were one of our patients. Tears were seen rolling down our cheeks, and we all hoped that we might keep the rest until we reached shore. There is little more for me to tell. The patients were admitted to the post hospital at Fortress Monroe, Virginia. I returned to New York with the other Red Cross nurses. Many of us signed army contracts to continue nursing, and I was soon sent back to Fort Monroe. Needless to say, my former patients were glad to see me. What did we learn from the experience? the need of properly equipped hospital ships and hospital trains, as well as hospitals for patients in time of war, the need of competent executive and administrative officers to arrange for transportation and equipment of the working personnel, and the need of the right woman in the right place to do the work. <laughs>